Our Heavenly Father, we come before you again in spirit and in truth, Lord, that we can uplift your holy name. I pray, and it's wonderful that you allow us to fellowship together with the people of God, those that are looking forward to your soon return. I ask now for your holy angels to attend this meeting, the Holy Spirit, and your presence to be here. Uplift us and uplift our minds to heaven. And let me speak the words you've given only. And Lord, I pray that we will not only receive the truth that you have for us, but that we will also bless others with the same truth. I ask this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this uh, second part of, of the presentation is called A Time of Unity and Separation. A Time of Unity and Separation. And today we are living in a time of unity and separation from the church in the church and in the world. And, and many of God's professed people are uniting with the world in apostasy. And while the faithful remnant are truly separating themselves from sin and unrighteousness, both in the world and in the church, there are those that are uniting with the apostasy. It's blatant, open apostasy that is going on. And at the same time, God is calling his faithful sheep out of the doomed churches in order to unite with the people of God and to walk in the truth and the light of his word and also to separate themselves from the darkness of deception and error. So what a tremendous time it is for us to be alive today and to see prophecy fulfilling to the very letter, it should fill us all with hope and encouragement. You know, as the events that precede the second coming of Jesus are unfolding before our eyes, it should strengthen our resolve as students of Bible prophecy to stand firm in our faith and in the foundation of truth. And we have to ask this question, why is it today that so many of us among God's last day church who have heard these truths for such a long time are wavering in our faith and are becoming confused. And even though we know that if we remain faithful, we will soon see Jesus in the clouds of heaven, there are some who have allowed Satan to bring in doubt and confusion into their minds by uh, listening to his uh, specious suggestions. And some of us, we've uh, yielded ourselves to his temptation and his temptations, and we don't even realize it. And the answer is simply because I believe we've taken our eyes off of Jesus and are instead looking at ourselves and each other and looking for leaders to lead us. And unfortunately, some of these leaders are leading us in the wrong direction. We are comparing ourselves to other sinful beings instead of looking at the one and only one who is sinless and who is a perfect example for all of us and for all humanity, Jesus Christ. And this, my friends, is really a, a recipe for disaster. We have to resist the temptation to do this, or we're going to miss out on the opportunity to meet Jesus in the clouds of heaven uh, when he returns a second time. And because as we can see, we can clearly see that things are rapidly deteriorating in this world, and the time for us to prepare is getting very, very short. This should really be obvious to anyone who is paying attention, but sometimes we need a reminder. Unity and separation in the church and in the world are one of the final signs to us that the end is near. This is our scripture text, Isaiah 61 and 2. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Amen. Friends, it is us as the professed people of God who are to give the loud cry. 
the final warning to come out of her, my people. And this is the final warning to prepare for what is coming upon the world very soon. And this is really what the three angels' messages are all about. If we're not even hearing or seeing these messages given in many of our churches today, we're going to give these same messages to anyone else if we're not hearing them. How can we give something else, something that we're not even familiar with and we do not believe ourselves? You know, I think you can all see the problem here that if some of our conference leaders and pastors in many of our churches are promoting unity with Babylon, how can we then give them the three angels' messages when we're uniting with them? How can we tell them to separate from Babylon at the same time? These are two conflicted messages that are opposed directly to each other. And this is the very definition of confusion. And we all know who the author of that is. Notice here, interfaith apostasy, we are moving from interfaith dialogue to becoming members of the same fraternal organization with Roman Catholics and Protestants. We have become brothers of the same chivalric knighthood order. So how can a believer in the three angels message call an unbeliever a brother. If we are uniting with the world, that means, friends, we are separating ourselves from Christ. It's automatic. And this is what's going on. If Satan would love Adventists today to give a conflicted message because it renders it completely useless and it's ineffective. It would make us nothing more than modern-day Pharisees, modern-day hypocrites, just like in the days of Christ. We say one thing and then we do another. So the world is confused. Do we listen to the words they say, or do we watch their actions? Which one? And we've already seen too much of that going on in our church today. And of course, all of us have heard the same excuses time and time again. Friends, they say, oh yeah, we're witnessing. No, you're not witnessing to the man of sin, friend. He has already been witnessed to, and he already knows who we are and exactly what we are. That excuse has already been used. Here we had uh, a luncheon, a secret luncheon. It wasn't disclosed at the time. The Ganoon Diop Awards Ted Wilson at a private ecumenical luncheon with Agents of Rome held during the 61st GC session. And in that luncheon, he stated what a privilege for Seventh-day Adventists and other Christians, and I'm quoting, to be epistles of Christ, representatives of the highest authority of the universe. Let me ask you a question. Can you imagine the prophet Elijah claiming that the priests of Baal were representatives of God? No, I can't either, friends. These were ambassadors from Babylon that were being hosted at a special lunch during the last GC session. And then, not two days later, Elder Ted preached a sermon warning about ecumenical relationships. So let me get this straight. He praised them on Thursday and then warned us about them on Saturday. My friends, that's called a conflicted message. That's confusion. As one pastor says, your actions speak so loud we can't hear what you're saying. We don't need to give the world a conflicted message, friends. If you are somebody who believes that having secret meetings and signing ecumenical agreements with his representatives of Babylon to promote their false doctrine as witnessing, then I'm sorry, but you've been deceived. They've won you over to their side, and we haven't convinced them of anything, friends. Uh, it's important to understand that, yes, Jesus ate with publicans and sinners, but he always always gave them the straight truth and never withheld it. He gave them the exact same opportunity to be saved as he did to the scribes and Pharisees. He did not join any secret agreements with them. He didn't promote anything that they were promoting. He gave them the truth. This was not a witnessing meeting, friends. Was there three angels' messages being given out? We need to understand the deception. Jesus never signed an agreement to compromise with any of them. He gave them a plain, thus saith the Lord. Please, let's not use that excuse. And that's exactly what we should be doing instead of making secret agreements with Babylon. 
If we are uniting with the world's friends, then we are separating ourselves from God because light has no fellowship with darkness. And if we're making secret agreements with Babylon, we are setting ourselves up to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and we will surely depart from the faith. Notice this, Maranatha 202, as trials thicken around us, both, notice that word, separation and unity will be seen in our ranks. Some who are now ready to take up weapons of warfare will in times of real peril make it manifest that they have not built upon the solid rock, they will yield to temptation. Those who have had great light and precious privileges but have not improved them will under one pretext or another go out from us. Not having received the love of the truth, they will be taken in the delusions of the enemy they will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and will depart from the faith. And notice that she says will depart from the faith, not maybe or may depart from the faith. And let's look at this further. But on the other hand, when the storm of persecution really breaks upon us, the true sheep will hear the true shepherd's voice. Self-denying efforts will be put forth to save the lost. And many who have strayed from the fold will come back to follow the great shepherd. The people of God will draw together and present to the enemy a united front, end quote. So as is stated here, the separating and uniting are both happening at the same time among God's people here. And while we're going, we have an opportunity to walk in the light and bring souls to Christ, others among us are going to depart from the faith and walk in darkness by seeking to become one with the world. Yes, we must have unity, but we can never unite under error and apostasy. We can only unite under the truth because error and apostasy is not going up. So let's look at this, James 4, 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is what? The enemy of God. So, friends, we need to see that God gives his professed last day church this very sobering warning found in 2 Peter 2, verse 20 and 21. Let's read that. 2 Peter 2, 20 and 21. For if they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. So what this means, friend, unity with the world brings disunity and disharmony with God. That those among us, those leaders, and members who are seeking to compromise with Babylon and the world will lose everything, friends. I know that there are church members who believe that we should compromise with those that are in error and apostasy to show love or charity. But notice, I want you to notice this next statement from the pen of inspiration. This is from the Sanctified Life 65. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. In this age of boasted liberality, these words would be branded as bigotry. But the apostle teaches that while we should manifest Christian courtesy, we are authorized to call sin and sinners by their right names. I'm going to read that again underlined. We are authorized to call sin and sinners by their right names, that this is consistent with true charity. Let's read on. While we are to love the souls for whom Christ died and labor for their salvation, we should not, underlined, make a compromise with sin. We are not to unite with the rebellious and call this charity. God requires his people in this age of the world to stand, as did John in his time, 
unflinchingly for the right in opposition to soul-destroying errors. This is plain and simple. These are our marching orders because if we plan to be part of the 144,000, guess what, friends? You're a watchman by default. This statement is clear as the noonday. There's to be no compromise with sin and sinners. And to call that charity is really an insult to God. So God has given us abundant light to share in this dark world of uh, the truth for salvation. So we've been given our marching orders, friends. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 5.8. Ephesians 5.8. And I'll go ahead and read it in your hearing. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye children light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And then drop down to verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Notice it doesn't say have some fellowship. It says have no fellowship. So these texts, again, are crystal clear, brothers and sisters. We are to walk as children of light, and we are to have no fellowship with the works of darkness. So there really should not be any confusion here whatsoever. Instead of making excuses for our church leaders and others, as many members are wont to do, who are compromising with the priests of Baal, we should shine the light of truth upon them and upon those in darkness and have no fellowship with them. So whenever we eat and we drink and we enter into unholy alliances with the agents of Babylon, then God is counting us on the side of the enemy of souls. And we're going to suffer with the wicked when the wrath of God is poured out if we don't repent. We cannot join in with them. We cannot have any fellowship with them. We, our job is to spread the truth of the three angels' messages. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 10. And let's look at that. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 20 to 21. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. This is quite clear, friends. We must decide whose side we're on. We can't sit on the fence because if we try to be neutral, the spirit of prophecy tells us we will be counted on the other side. Notice this, manuscript 82, good and evil sometimes harmonize, never harmonize. Between light and darkness, there can be no compromise. Truth is light revealed, error is darkness. Light has no fellowship with darkness righteousness, no fellowship with unrighteousness. The safety of Christ's soldiers is assured only when they work and sleep with their armor on, end quote. So what this is saying is that we have to rely solely on the power of God if we are to maintain our integrity and to have success in this Christian warfare. You know, we can never, ever compromise with sin and sinners. We must always be on our guard at all times to be safe from the delusions of the devil. And I know sometimes it seems that some of our church leaders and others are so anxious to compromise with the world that they've completely forgotten God's counsel that was given to us in the apostle in uh, 2 Corinthians. And we'll, we'll look at that. And what I want to say, uh, in fact, let's turn there. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath a righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Verse 16. And what agreement? hath the temple of God with idols. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, 
and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Amen. Do we want to be sons and daughters of God? Then we must put on the whole armor of God, friends. We must represent God in all things. We must walk in the light to be children of the light. We cannot compromise. And there's so many people today that are compromising and we're giving a compromising messages. It, it's almost shameful to see some of the messages that are the uh, sermons that are posted online for the world to see. It's as if they're seeing irreverent services. We're seeing messages that are just nonsense and it's foolishness in the house of God. And it's embarrassing. We as present truth Adventists should never have to apologize for the world to look on some of these services that they're posting online. We, uh, almost, it's almost better if they took the name Adventist off, because then we wouldn't have to explain it. Let's look at this. First Thessalonians 5, 5. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. And I want to read this from Signs of the Times, June 3rd, 1903. To walk in the light means advancement and progress in spiritual attainments. Paul declared, not as though I had already attained, neither were already perfect, but forgetting those things which are behind, constantly beholding the pattern, I reach forth unto those things which are before. Notice these bolded words, to walk in the light means to walk uprightly, to walk in the way of the Lord, to walk by faith, to walk in the spirit, to walk in the truth, to walk in love, to walk in newness of life. It is perfecting holiness in the fear of God, end quote. So this statement is the exact opposite with those who are walking in darkness. It is compromise, those that want to compromise with those who are in darkness. And it is the reason for this, it is the absence of Christ that leads to darkness. We cannot follow church leaders or pastors or anyone else who is not walking in the light of truth that God has so abundantly poured out upon us. Those who are in apostasy can never, ever lead us to Christ, but they will separate us from him. Turn in your Bibles to 1 John 1. Let's read verse 5 to 7. 1 John 1, verse 5 to 7. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is light and have fellowship with one another, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so why is it so important that we stand up boldly for the truth in these last days? The reason is because Satan is walking about like a roaring lion. He's waiting for any glimpse of weakness that we have and any sign of doubting that we have in us. He knows that if we have difficulty standing for the truth right now, we're going to fold when the real trials come upon us when the real persecution comes. He knows that if we're compromising our faith right now, when there is no persecution to speak of, we're going to be easily overcome later when the tests and trials become a matter of freedom or prison or even facing persecution for our faith or death. Only those, only those who pass the test that God gives us now are going to be able to pass the final test when everything is on the line. You can't pass the final exam if you failed all the other tests. It doesn't work that way. You have to pass all the tests that lead up, that God gives us to lead up to the final exam, and then you'll pass the final exam. Notice that from sons and daughters of God, 201, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The very atmosphere is polluted with sin. Soon, God's people will be tested by fiery trials. And the great proportion of those who now appear to be genuine and true will prove to be base metal. 
instead of being strengthened and confirmed by opposition, threats, and abuse, notice these words in red, they will cowardly take the side of the opposers. The promise is them that honor me, I will honor. Already the judgments of God are abroad in the land as seen in storms, in floods, in tempests, in earthquakes, in perils by land and by sea. And notice this continuing, the great I am is speaking to those who make void his law. When God's wrath is poured out upon the earth, who will then be able to stand? Now, when now is the time for God's people to show themselves true to principles? When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching to stand in the defense of truth and righteousness when the majority, how much the majority forsake us to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. At this time, we must gather warmness from the coldness of others, courage from cowardice, from their cowardice and loyalty from their treason, end quote. So we see, friends, from inspiration that God doesn't want any cowards or compromisers in his army. He wants those who will stand with courage and firmness in defense of the truth. He wants those who have proved their loyalty to Christ by holding up the banner of truth with faith and perseverance. Now, friends, now is the time for us to be closely connected to Christ that we can be hid when the wrath of God is poured out upon this wicked world. Too many of the people in our church, too many of the leaders or watchmen that should be telling us are not saying a word. They're afraid, they're scared. We wanna be among those who will be called out. We will be then among those that are gonna be called out to give the last warning message, the final warning to this doomed planet. Because the loud cry of the third angel's message is going to be the final call, the final message of mercy before the close of probation. And as the third angel's message, it swells to into a loud cry, some are going to accept this message. And then they're going to stand with the people of God through the time of trouble. Let's look at this. Revelation 18, verse 4 and 5. Revelation 18, 4 and 5. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. It doesn't say join in with her. It says, come out of her, my people, and be ye not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. So now there are some that might ask, well, how do we show our loyalty to God? What special traits of character uh, will the people of God need, need in order to uh, reveal these traits in our lives? Well, let's look at that. Testimonies, Volume 8, 118. Those whose faith and zeal are proportionate to their knowledge of the truth will reveal their loyalty to God by what? Communicating the truth. Let's read that again. We, they will reveal, reveal their loyalty to God by communicating the truth. We can't hide it. And it's all saving, sanctifying power to those with whom they associate. Their lives of holiness and unselfish service will be in conformity with the vital principles of the kingdom of heaven, end quote. So these are those who have put on the whole armor of God. And they've been purified by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Let's turn in our Bibles to... Ephesians 6, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 13. And it tells us, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. And so, beloved, now is the time for us to unite and join God's army. 
we have to separate, we must separate ourselves from evil and never compromise with sin. Yes, the wheat and tares will grow together till the harvest, but that is not an excuse to listen to error and sit in apostasy because there are wheat and tares all over the world. There are wheat and tares in some of the uh, best present truth churches you have. If your church is preaching present truth, you stay there. If your church is in a reverent atmosphere, you stay there. If not, you find a place. There are many, there are thousands of Adventists that are home churching. Why? Because they can't find a reverent place that's giving them the straight testimony. And what is it that causes the shaking? It's the straight testimony. There are too many in our church today who are trying to remain, remain neutral in a time of crisis. And that's regarded as God as a grievous crime. In our denominations, we have many what I call so-called present truth speakers and evangelists who travel to churches around the country and all over the world. They have a big following, and not only in this country, and they preach against the sins of Babylon. They're willing to point out all the sins of Babylon, and they're more than willing to carefully scrutinize and expose the sins and apostasy of, of the churches in Babylon to the world. But at the very same time, when our church is under attack by these wolves, they have nothing to say. When some of our own church leaders are flaunting their open sin and apostasy to the world, they're silent. They see church leaders promoting ecumenical unity with Babylon. They see them participating in idolatrous worship services, defending interfaith worship services that these worship services glorify paganism, spiritualism, and idol worship. And they see some of our leaders joining with the priests of Baal, and they're quiet. They have nothing to say. They're quiet as this church mouse here. They're so quiet you can hear a pin drop. Not one peep is heard from these watchmen. No word of rebuke or reproof can ever be heard from these men. You can go down the list in Adventism, look at the names. Which one will stand up and rebuke open sin? We're not talking about secret sins, friends. We're talking about open sin and open apostasy, open rebellion against God. You know, we are told many of them will preach a corporate salvation. There's no corporate salvation, friends. You're not saved by being members of a church. You're not saved by the denomination. You're not saved by the conference. You're not saved by any church. You're saved by your obedience to Jesus Christ. Notice this. This is a t quote from Manuscript 66. Jesus, the very errors and misconception of darkened minds call forth lessons that make it essential for the church to practice godliness in every circumstance, not merely to those who belong to our sect, but to all in need of mercy and relief. She says all, and notice these words here, Jesus showed that none are saved by being members of a particular church, but as individual believers in Jesus Christ, as their personal savior. There are many, not a few, she says many, who belong to a church, but who do not belong to Christ. So without that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you can call yourself Adventist or whatever you want to call yourself. It doesn't matter. You have to be joined to Christ. And uh, let's look at this further. I am the true vine. This is from Desire of Pages 675. The Jews had always regarded the vine as the most noble of plants, and a type of all that was powerful, excellent, and fruitful. Israel had been represented as a vine which God had planted in the promised land. The Jews based their hope of salvation, notice this, on the fact of their connection with Israel. But Jesus says, I am the real vine. Think not that through a connection with Israel, you may become partakers of the life of God and inheritance inheritors of his promise. Through me alone, notice the word alone, is spiritual life received. So you're not going to be saved by your connection with a conference or any other church. You're going to be saved by your connection to Christ. I hope that's clear. John 51 says, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. And let's look at Ezekiel 33, 31. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people. And they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after covetousness. If we don't live the life that we're preaching, then we are no better. We are hypocrites. We're no better than scribes and Pharisees. You know, the, world church, the word church 
it's mentioned in the New Testament. It comes from the Greek term ecclesia, which means uh, it's formed from two Greek words, meaning an assembly or to call out the called out ones called out from one from what sin and apostasy. It doesn't matter where you run into that. If it's in a, a self-supporting church, a conference or any other church, you are not to unite yourself with sin and apostasy. And yes, those watchmen, those few watchmen that are speaking up, they're going to be attacked. They've been attacked. They've been ridiculed and condemned. But that's okay. John 15, 20 says, remember the word. What did Jesus say? The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. If they kept my saying, they'll keep yours also. So you should expect persecution if you're preaching the straight truth. Because it's the straight testimony, my friends, that causes causes the shaking. It's the straight testimony. And let's look further here. Um, so what I said before is the truth is never going to be popular. This is not a popularity contest. Too many of our leaders, too many of these present truth evangelists are sacrificing the truth and the straight testimony on the altar of popularity. And th that's not going to help them make it into the kingdom, friends. You know, the truth, if the truth was popular, then Christ would have never been crucified. His message was not a popular message. Church leaders of the day, they didn't want to hear from him or his disciples. His message of rebuke and repute for their, his reproof and rebuke for their sin and apostasy was not welcome to them. And it's the same today, friends. Nothing has changed. You go back and read the story of Israel and how they closed their probation. Very, very sobering, friends. So we don't want to follow in those footsteps. I ask the question again, where are the speakers today? Where are the speakers that are willing to give the true Elijah message? Where are they? Where are the Isaiahs, the Nehemiahs, Amoses? Where are they that will stand up boldly for the truth? And I'm not talking about the flowery, soft sermons which are preached in many of our churches today so as not to offend anyone. The truth is going to offend, but you stand up, you preach the truth in love because you love them and you don't want them to perish. And I'm going to tell you what, that's not the Elijah message that we're hearing. This is the Elijah message. Listen, Testimonies, Volume 3, page 280. In the, light, in the full light of the sun, surrounded by thousands, men of war, prophets of Baal, and the monarch of Israel stands the defenseless man, Elijah. Apparently alone, yet not alone. The most powerful host of heaven surrounds him. Angels who excel in strength have come from heaven to shield the faithful and righteous prophet. With stern and commanding voice, Elijah cries, notice how what this says, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word, not one. And that vast assembly dared utter one word for God and show his loyalty to Jehovah. And we see that happening again and again. What astounding deception and fearful blindness had like a dark cloud covered Israel. This blindness and apostasy had not closed about them suddenly, it had come upon them gradually, gradually as they had not heeded the word of reproof and warning, which the Lord had sent to them because of their pride and their sins. Notice these words in red. And now in this fearful crisis, in the presence of the idolatrous priest and the apostate king, they remained neutral. If God abhors one sin above another, of which his people are guilty, it is doing nothing in the case of an emergency, indifference neutr and neutrality in a religious crisis is regarded of God as a grievous crime and equal to the very worst type of hostility against God. And quote, friends, Elijah stood as one man, one man against the leaders of Israel, yet God stood with him. If we're planning to be part of the 144,000 friends, then we are watchmen. A true watchman will never remain silent in the face of idolatry and apostasy. It doesn't matter if we're greatly outnumbered or if we're the only one. We cannot remain silent. What happened in the case of Phineas? One man, friends, 
One man stopped the plague. How many people died? Was it 24,000? Many people died. And one man stood up because he had a zeal for God and he had a zeal for God's truth. And because he had a zeal for God, God said in Numbers 25, 8 through 12, Wherefore say, behold, I give him my covenant of peace, because he turned the wrath away, his wrath away. One man, because he stood up, he stood up, and, and 24,000 were consumed. So it doesn't matter if you're the only ones. We have to stand up for the truth. And we are, again, given this warning from God's prophet. This is from General Conference Daily Bulletin. April 13, 1891, let not those who have the truth as it is in Jesus give sanction even by their silence to the work of the mystery of iniquity. Let them never cease to sound the note of alarm. And here we read Isaiah 58, 1, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. And let's look at Joel. Joel 2.1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Our message as faithful watchmen is to cry aloud and to spare not. We are to warn spiritual Israel, God's last day church, of those who are in danger of separating themselves from God by uniting with those in apostasy. And if we claim to be a watchman and we keep quiet and we let church members go right over the cliff, their blood will be on our hands. We have to warn the world that the day of the Lord is at hand and we have to give that last message of mercy to humanity before it is forever too late. You know, yes, there are those that are in the self-supporting work that have been attacked for doing self-supporting work. But God doesn't limit. There are no boundaries. Listen to this. This is from Manuscript 29. But many ought to be out of the lines that have been maintained to be regular and routine. And unless they themselves come into line, they will say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are we. Unless the temple is purified, cleansed, sanctified, God will not give them his presence in the temple of which they boast. That means it doesn't matter what name is on the outside. God's presence won't be there unless we are honoring him in our worship services. The whole world needs to be worked, but not after the present principles. And notice this, it says, behold, the possessions of the world are mine. There are no territorial lines. There are no boundaries to be made. I mean, God doesn't want to put limits on his work and saying, if you're not part of this organization or that, you can't do the Lord's work. If you're marching to heaven with the saints and you're doing the Lord's work, what happened when the disciples complained, this man followeth us and he doesn't follow us and he's teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? What did they say? Jesus said, he that is not uh, against us is with us. Notice this again, underline. The situation was again presented and the urgency of occupying the fields were presented to me. Then being worked under the supervision of God, using Edson White as his agency to open the field. See, they didn't want to support the work of Edson White because he was not in the working outside the regular lines. Notice what she says. Those who should have rejoiced to see something done were determined to give no recognition to Edson White or the work because he did not work in the regular lines. He wasn't under the conference. But notice, God has presented before you how he regarded the regular lines. The regular lines had need to be broken as a potter's vessel is broken and reconstructed. And the men in responsible positions convert heart, soul, and body. That's manuscript 29, 1903. So friends, God is no respecter of persons. He wants those that are willing to stand up for the truth, though the heavens fall. If we go back and we see many people are saying, you can only do this or we can only work in that field. Friends, God doesn't want you to join in apostasy. He doesn't care where it is. He does not care where it is. Conference, not conference, it doesn't matter. 
That's why in First Testimonies pages 5, 261 and 262, it says God will not condone our using tithe for the preaching of apostasy or any use other than specified. There are fearful woes for those who preach the truth but are not sanctified by it. And also for those who consent to receive and maintain the unsanctified to minister to them in word and doctrine. There you have it. It's right there in plain English. If God doesn't want us to support those that are in apostasy and support those who are unsanctified, if he doesn't want us to support them with our money. He certainly, we don't need to support them with our presence if we're not hearing present truth because it's not preparing you for heaven. Now is the time to be prepared for the courts above. And this is from letter 400, 1906. The signs are certainly fulfilling that show that the end of this earth history is near. And we have an individual work to do in fitting ourselves to sound the last message of warning to our world and prepare it for the closing scenes, which, according to the word of God, are soon to come. I feel deeply the need of every worker to stand as a faithful watchman to give this last note of warning, to prepare the church that those who have had the light may be awake, realizing the importance of keeping every piece of armor on, end quote. So let's turn in our Bibles to Jeremiah 31, and let's read verse 6 and 7. Jeremiah 31, verse 6 and 7. For there shall be a day that the watchman upon the Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. For thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob. And shout among the chief of the nations, publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. Friends, only a remnant will be saved. Only a remnant, only a precious few. We want to be among that remnant. We cannot be Adventists in name only. We cannot be hypocrites. We, our lives must reflect the character of Christ. And it is time. It is time for us to unite with the people of God. And those who are truly, truly preparing to be sealed with the seal of God. And to separate ourselves from those who are walking in darkness. And it doesn't matter where that darkness is, friends. Righteousness still has no fellowship with unrighteousness. And light has no communion with darkness. Notice this. Manuscript 108, 1903. There is to be a clear distinction between those who serve God and those who serve him not, between those who honor him by keeping his commandments and those who are disobedient. If we have respect to the future reward, we will, in this life, be separate from those who disobey God. We need to be Bible students. No one need be in doubt as to the character he is to develop that he may make his calling and election sure. Friends, we cannot be afraid, just like that pastor earlier who lost his privilege, he lost his paycheck, he was willing to do that to stand up for the truth. And he said he would not repent because he wanted to stand up for the truth. We can't worry about that. There's too many in the church that are worried about their paycheck or worried about their position or worried about their following or worried about the money. Friends, it's not going to matter very soon. We have to show God whose side we're on. The character that we are to develop is the character of Christ. We have to avoid even the appearance of evil. We cannot do that if we're joining with the world and adopting worldly customs and habits. Uniting with the church is not the same as uniting with Christ. And there are many members, as she says, who are not united to Christ. So we have to work in obedience to Christ. Notice this manuscript 144. 1897, there will be those who have had every opportunity to become sons and daughters of God, but they decided that they would not wear Christ's yoke of obedience. Their names were on the church books, but they did not live a Christian life. They did not at the very start knit their souls with Christ, let all unite with Christ first, and then unite with the church. 
those who place their names on the church record without surrendering all to Christ, expecting to take them with their own habits and practices, with them, their own habits and practices, they dishonor their Savior. Their words are against Christ. Their actions are contrary to him. Friends, we must, it's time for us to be serious and do some serious soul searching because we know that we have to stand faithful to God. Just like what happened in the children of Israel when they closed their probation, they thought that because they were connected to the church, they were going to be saved. Friends, that connection didn't save them. You know, there are wheat and tares even in Christ's own church. He had 12 disciples. Was there a tear among them? Yes. So we cannot use the wheat and tears as an excuse any longer. We have to stand up for Christ because it's what we see and what we hear and participate in as to whether we're being uh, developed for the kingdom of heaven or developed for the fires of hell. And we all have to make that choice. This is our only opportunity to become sons and daughters of God. And this is the great day of atonement, friends. And Jesus is our advocate and he's pleading. He's pleading as our intercessor before the Father. Let us daily humble ourselves before God. We need to confess and repent of our sins and cooperate with Christ in preparing souls to reflect his image. Friends, let us all work out our own salvation with fear and trembling before the door of probation closes forever. Then we can say earnestly, like the Apostle Paul has said in 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, Let's turn there. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to, be, not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. It's my prayer today, brothers and sisters, that we are among the group that will be translated to heaven, part of the 144,000, and we will pass the test that God is giving us now before the storm of persecution comes upon us. We cannot compromise with sin. Jesus Christ is not the minister of sin. He's the minister of righteousness, and we want to be part of his church in heaven because that's the church. That is the church that counts, his church in heaven. If we are in a faithful church that's promoting the gospel truth, that is a reverent church, then we stay there and be a part and lift these people up. But we cannot participate in apostasy. We cannot compromise. And my prayer that each and every one here will take this to heart and stand up and join God's armies today and go out and bring souls to Christ. Amen. Amen. Please join me now as I close in prayer. I'm going to kneel in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we still have an opportunity to be members of your church in heaven. You've continued to give us that opportunity. Help us to live and to show by our lives, not just our words, by our lives, that we are truly historic Adventists that are preaching and giving the straight truth and witnessing to others and giving them the last message of mercy that we can be accounted faithful. There will be no starless crowns in heaven. We all must bring someone with us. And I pray that we will all go to work for the Lord and stand up and be found faithful so that when persecution comes upon us, we will not bend and we will never, ever compromise or step off the platform of truth. I ask this now in the name of Jesus Christ, our loving Savior. Amen. Yeah.